Hello, my name is Michael O'Keefe, aka The Movie List. If you enjoyed this interview and want to hear more top-notch film industry conversations, please press the thumbs up, subscribe to this channel, and hit the bell to stay in the know. Hello, Carl Johnson. Uh, before we chat about your music uh, for the screen, can you tell us how you've been handling COVID-19? Uh, hi, Michael. Uh, well, uh, interestingly enough, um, with the whole uh, coronavirus thing, um, it's caused a lot of people in the entertainment industry to uh, to work from home. Uh, but for composers, um, the prospect of going days without seeing other people and working in isolation and nothing you but you and your computer, uh, you know, it feels like Tuesday. Um, that <laughs> that's how mm -hmm. we all work normally. So um, for for uh, composers, it's really kind of business as usual. Um, that it, it tends to be kind of a solitary uh, endeavor. So um, uh, in, in the one sense, uh, it, it's, it's really not been a whole lot of interruption in the way my normal workflow has, has gone. Um, that being said, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's a, a tremendous burden on everyone. And um, the production team on the show that I'm working on, Looney Tunes Cartoons, um, many of them have had to transition from working in a centralized office to doing their work at home. Um, and their comment was now we finally get to see how it is to work the way you do. <laughs> so um, it's, uh, it, it's been a, a change, but generally for composers, it's kind of business as usual. Interesting. So uh, that was a great segue. I was wondering if you could give us a general uh, sense of tone for Looney, the Looney Tunes cartoons and also the uh, tone you aim for it more specifically through, through your music. Well, uh, in general, the creative direction behind the Looney Tunes cartoons was what made the original Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies cartoons work? What was so special about them? And let's try to not reinvent or change something that was working, but let's try to continue in that direction and um, <clears throat> honor the, uh, the traditions that those people had, had established and try to continue them rather than reinvent them or reimagine them or somehow rebrand them. Um, so that was the original idea for the series and musically, um, that's what we've been trying to do also. What musically made the original Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies work? Um, and what was it about the music of Carl Stalling, who wrote all that original music, that was so recognizable and iconic and worked so well? And let's take those characteristics and, um, and incorporate them into this new... Um, batch of stuff and, and try to make it sound as much like the originals as possible. What is it about kids shows that you gravitate towards as a composer? Um, at the beginning of my career, I did not set out to uh, concentrate on, on music for children or, or, or family projects. It's just sort of something that I fell into, but um, it has been a very rewarding area of the entertainment industry to work in. Um, I, I work at home, I have a family, I have kids, um, and um, occasionally I've worked on projects like a, a horror film or, or something where it's not really kid friendly and it, it's a little awkward when my kids wander into the studio and I have to quickly turn off the monitor and you know pretend like I wasn't working on something. Um, it's much more rewarding to have something like Bugs Bunny on the screen and uh, when the kids walk in and see that I'm, I'm working with Bugs Bunny, I, I go up in their estimation a lot. <laughs> so it's, it's always good for uh, a few daddy points. Um, but uh, um, it's, it's also something uh, working on family centered projects is, is very rewarding um, that it's something that people generally remember for, for the rest of their lives. Um, I've, I've worked on projects um, that people now 20 or so years later say, well, I remember listening to that as a kid. Now I listen to it with my kids. 
um, it, and it's it's really it's a special thing to be involved in that kind of um, that kind of family history for for lots of people. Yeah, I mean, you worked on a show that I loved as a kid, which is Pinky and the Brain. Yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> and uh, for example, there's a, another one. Um, uh, Winnie the Pooh's Grand Adventure, The Search for Christopher Robin. And, um, you know, it, it was one that I had written uh, when my wife and I were expecting our first child. And um, so it kind of holds a special place in my memory just because of what was happening in my life at that time. But I've had dozens of people tell me afterwards, you know, this was a special project because I listened to it with my kids or my my parents played it for me or you know, things like that, that, um, you know, really make it a, a personal connection with the music. And, and I find that very rewarding. Uh, can you tell me what it was like to work on Pinky and the Brain? What was, what was the vibe like? Um, it, was, it was really uh, an amazing experience. Richard Stone was the, the supervising composer on that. And um, uh, I had worked with Rich earlier on Animaniacs, and Pinky mm. and the Brain was kind of the spinoff. Um, and uh, Rich was a marvelous teacher and mentor. He um, really uh, took took the time to explain what he was looking for and to to be a um, a constructive critic. And uh, if he didn't like something, he'd let you know. And if he did like something, he'd he'd compliment it. Um, but he he took a lot of extra effort to um, to kind of help me define my style and specifically learn what this Carl Stalling style was and how to achieve it. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of that vibe of Pinky and the Brain musically was all about Rich Stone. Um, mm. Pinky and the Brain, we were able to, to stretch a little bit. Um, it was, um, it, it got, it, the story tended to um, expand a little bit from where Animaniacs were generally and also from where the original Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies were, but um, basically still in that same musical universe. So um, you also worked on Skyfall, which is a lot of fun. And I was wondering what, uh, if you could tell me about that experience and also well, are you a fan of John Barry and, and his original work for, uh, for James Bond? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, the Bond films have always been uh, favorites of mine, and John Barry, uh, you know, is just a legend. Mm -hmm. um, on Skyfall, um, I was actually one of a, a kind of a, a team of support orchestrators brought in to help on that. Um, uh, uh, James Horner um, was the uh, the composer on that, um, and. Uh, James normally had uh, his lead orchestrator, a guy named Jack Redford. Um, and uh, often Jack Redford uh, does the orchestrations himself unless um, time uh, becomes too short and he needs to call in a support team. And uh, I'm one of several people that Jack would generally reach out to um, to try to uh, cover things when when it was getting close to uh, <laughs> deadline time. So um, that's one uh, uh, that, that I got brought into to kind of help bring it in the last five, uh, five, five yards, as it were. Interesting. And I would love, love to hear maybe wh what's it like to orchestrate a score to material you did not compose to versus uh, uh, just composing? What, what's, what's that experience like? Um, and, you know, I just need to go back and, and uh, correct something. It was, it was Thomas Newman who was the composer on the score. Ah. Not, uh, I, I just, sorry, Fair I, enough. I was thinking about something else. No um, problem. Uh, orchestration is its own kind of specific um, mindset. Uh, orchestrating, the orchestrator is it's kind of a vague term. And mm. um, in some situations, the orchestrator... Um, really all they're doing is just kind of copying what the composer has already done. Uh, it used to be like people like John Williams will do a sketch and on the sketch, all of the information, all of the detail is there. Uh, and it's just a matter of the orchestrator taking it from the sketch page and then putting it on the big score page. Um, different composers work in different ways. Uh, some composers 
uh, only play into a, uh, a computer. And so all of the information that they have is as a computer file. And so it's the, um, the orchestrator's job to take that information off the computer file and then uh, translate it into something humans can read and then put it on the score page. So it's, it's kind of a wide variety of uh, job responsibilities that the orchestrator has to do. So um, part, of the, part of the challenge and the mindset of it is um, trying to discern what the composer wants, um, that the way you program in a certain sound in a computer um, has to be translated into the way a, a human would play an instrument to achieve that same sound. So you're really diving into the, um, the detail of the computer files, looking at um, controller information and, and velocity information and everything you can glean from the digital uh, file and then translate that into, um, into physical written music. Um, so it really, it's interesting that you kind of have to have uh, a brain for both sides of the, uh, the equation, the technological side, as well as the, uh, the pencil and paper side. Geez, I guess a lot has changed uh, when it comes to composing then. Or yeah. The orchestrating. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it used to be that orchestrators, all they had to do was take the sketch and mm -hmm. then put it onto the score. But um, generally now it involves a lot more um, translating computer files and uh, uh, that creates its own set of <laughs> pitfalls <laughs> sometimes, but, um, uh, but what, ultimately, what do you prefer? What do you prefer? The old way or this? Um, well, as a, as an orchestrator, uh, I think I prefer it when everything's all written out, but very few people do that anymore. And um, uh, when it, when you get a computer file, it, it requires a lot more kind of sleuthing, that uh, it, you have to be careful that you're not missing any details and that um, uh, you know that you're you're faithfully recreating the composer's intent um, and putting it down in such a way that it, it makes sense musically um, because ultimately when it's being played by an orchestra it has to be something that a, a human can look at and recognize and then recreate on their instrument oh, that's very interesting um... Wow, a little different uh, question. Uh, I was wondering, as someone in the music department, what has your interaction been like with the actors over your career? Well, generally very little. Um, it, as uh, a composer, film composer, usually you're the last person brought on the project. Um, and so in a, uh, a live action film, um, everything has been filmed months, if not years earlier. Um, the film is all edited. The very last thing to happen simultaneously with sound effects is the music. So uh, really the only production people that you have contact with are uh, editors and then the director and or producer. Um, I've worked on projects where I never met any of the actors until the release party. Um, mm. And uh, generally animation is, is the same way that the, uh, the voice actors, uh, the very first thing that happens in an animated project after the script is finished is they record the voices. Then the voices are edited together. Then the animation is created to fit the voices. Then the music is put on at the very end. So um, uh, generally the composer doesn't, doesn't get to work with the, the actors of the voice talent directly at all. Um, there are a few exceptions where uh, the actors have to sing something. Um, so, for example, in Animaniacs, almost every episode had a song, um, and um, most of those songs were either written by uh, Randy Rogel or um, Rich Stone uh, or somebody on the team. And those people would then get to go into the vocal recording sessions and work with the actors uh, directly, helping them to learn the music and get it recorded. Um, but uh, that's kind of the uh, the rarity. the The general rule is that composers don't get to work with the, the actors mm -hmm. much at all. Have you done red carpets before? Um, a couple, uh, and also uh, awards shows. Um, for me, I I, I tend to be uh, a kind of uh, I don't know if antisocial is the right word, but I don't generally feel comfortable in big situations like that. Um, 
I, I, I remember one time my wife and I were going to um, the Emmy Awards uh, in, in Los Angeles and um, it was it, it was pretty funny that we were in a kind of a line of people to do the red carpet walk and uh, mm-hmm. the the person in front of us was some actor I didn't recognize but all of the paparazzi instantly who knew knew who this person was and the, the flashes were going off and they were yelling out questions <laughs> and um, the person went inside and it was our turn to walk and it was absolutely silent. <laughs> I think one person flashed a picture in the back just to be polite, but uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I knew where my place was in the food chain. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, well, I'm a big fan of the composer. I mean, people, <laughs> a good score, it goes unnoticed, right? So you're just part of the viscera of the experience more or less. Yeah, yeah, there's a school of thought that the best film scores go unnoticed, at least for the first hearing. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I, th- I think that there's a lot of truth to that, that ultimately the music has to support the film. Um, but if there's a way to do it uh, and still have the music give a few moments to shine, then it's that much better. Um, I, 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 I'm always remembering the first time I saw Star Wars, uh, when I was a kid and of course the music was um, or the film itself was incredibly exciting and inspirational. Um, but I didn't even realize that at the time, but the music was so much a part of that experience and to be able to walk out of the uh, theater and be humming the tunes that I hadn't mm-hmm. known two hours earlier was really an amazing experience. Yeah, definitely. And like John Barry's, we were talking about that, uh, the James Bond music. I mean, that music stands out you don't not notice that that music and it, yeah. it, it totally works i mean who yeah. says that doesn't work yeah absolutely and um you know and john barry had such a gift with being able to come up with a, a theme and be able to use it um in a film in enough ways and enough creative ways that uh it just a became very memorable but b also perfectly fit the moments of the film yep uh do you have a favorite james bond soundtrack Oh my gosh, there's so many of them. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, I think, uh, you know, Skyfall has got to be one of my favorites. Um, Thomas Newman is just a a genius. Um, And and all of them have their their genius moments to it. Um, Gosh, it would be hard to, it would be hard to pick one that's that's superlative. I, I would say, you know, Goldfinger is a real standout. And To Live and Let Die is great, too. Absolutely. Well, <clears throat> my wife and I are big um, Beatles fans, and so oh, yeah. <clears throat> anything that's got a Paul McCartney song is uh, way up there for us. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, Carl, thank you very much for your time. I really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, before I let you go, could you please recommend a few albums uh, for my audience to listen to during their uh, quarantined lives? Ah, well, um, if you like film music, uh, you know, the the classic film music of the kind of the golden age of Hollywood uh, is a one of my favorite things to to go to probably my favorite album of all time is um, the best years of our lives uh, a a score by Hugo Friedhofer and there's a couple of versions of that album available Um, and it's just to me one of the best examples of classic film music Um, uh, Hugo Friedhofer somehow was able to sound more Aaron Copeland than even Copeland could. <laughs> um, that's a favorite. Also the uh, Charles Gerhardt recordings of um, uh, Corn Gold, uh, Seahawk, um, those classic scores are just amazing. Um, they're constantly a, a source of inspiration for me. Do you like any Italian film composers? Uh, well, yeah, uh, Ennio Morricone, of course, is uh, just a genius. And um, the, it's very hard uh, to listen to uh, Cinema Paradiso without getting teared up. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's such an emotionally gripping score. Um, so, you know, of course, that one has got to be way at the top of my list. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time, Carl. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael. And uh, I, I appreciate you taking the time. All right. Yeah, we... Uh...